Are you conscious? Yes. Could you, can you prove it? Uh, let's start over, sorry. Okay, are you conscious? No. So I went viral on TikTok. That clip now has over 8 million views. It's embarrassing enough telling people I'm a YouTuber. Now I'm a TikToker too? It's about damn time. In a minute, I'm gonna need a sentimental man or woman to pump me up. Feeling fussy, walking in my Balenciases, trying to bring out the fabulous. To anyone who's ever believed in me, who's ever encouraged me to pursue my creativity, I'd like to apologize for what I've become. I'm still adjusting to the TikTok influencer lifestyle. I'm learning the dance. I'm cutting off all my deadweight former friends with under 10,000 followers. Do you know who I am? You think you can just fucking look at me? My real friends now are the people who use my sound. Are you conscious? Yes. Could you, can you prove it? Uh, let's start over, sorry. Okay. Are you conscious? No. A defining feature of TikTok is that you can take the audio from someone else's video to use it in your own video, often for purposes of dancing, lip syncing, or general memification. In the few weeks since I posted it, the sound of my TikTok has become a bit of a trend. There are now over 20,000 TikToks using the sound, including ones from popular TikTokers with 10 million followers, from an Olympic athlete and a US figure skating silver medalist, from some cute cats. Are you conscious? Yes. Could you, can you prove it? Uh, let's start over, sorry. Okay. Are you conscious? No. The clipping question was from a goofy man on the street segment in my last YouTube video, in which I was in character as a hardcore solipsist who thinks nobody else is real. I'm the only conscious being in the universe. Which I don't actually believe, to be clear, in case you found me from those clips. The whole point in the context of the original video was to criticize that mentality. I in fact believe very strongly that other people are conscious. But I started posting the clips to TikTok thinking that maybe a few people would see them and check out my YouTube channel. I had never posted to TikTok before. I didn't have followers. The clip that took off was the second TikTok I ever posted and it got a million views in less than a day. I've been doing YouTube in some capacity since I was 11 years old. I have put years of work and energy into my videos, and my audience has grown slowly, but it's still pretty small. And then, on a whim, I post two low-effort TikToks and suddenly famous people are lip-syncing to me. Why? Why did this happen? My most successful platform may now be the 10 second lip sync app, but my heart still lies with in-depth cultural analysis. So today, I'm taking a deep dive into my own TikTok virality. Why did the video take off? And what can that tell us about online culture and our place within it? Are you conscious? Yes. Could you, can you prove it? Uh, let's start over, sorry. Okay, are you conscious? No. TikTok is known for its unpredictable algorithm. The vast majority of views on the app come from the For You page, an algorithmically curated feed of videos that's personalized for each user based on the grotesque amounts of data being constantly collected on them. Because of the centrality of the algorithm, TikTok makes it easier than most other platforms to go viral without an existing audience. People don't usually seek out specific content or creators, they just watch whatever the algorithm shows them. And within a few hours of posting it, the algorithm was showing lots of people my video. There are a few data points that presumably went into TikTok boosting the video. People tend to watch it all the way through without swiping away. Sometimes they watch it multiple times in a row, probably partially because when you're watching on TikTok it loops in a way where it's sort of hard to tell where it starts and ends. Are you conscious? No. Are you conscious? Yes. Are you conscious? No. Okay. Are you conscious? Yes. Are you conscious? No. No. It's also just a cute and funny clip, not primarily because of me, but because the person I was talking to is an iconic, relatable queen. So people like and comment and share it with friends, which tells the algorithm to show it to more users. People have also observed that the algorithm tends to give videos from newly created accounts an initial boost. I was already surprised when my first video got a few thousand views, and then the second one blew up. As the views started pouring in, the brain rot of TikTok virality 
personality was quickly taking over. I was checking my TikTok notifications first thing in the morning, last thing before I went to bed, and every two minutes in between. I was calculating useless statistics about the video, like that according to my TikTok analytics, three years of human life have now been spent watching that eight second clip. Imagine what else could have been done with that time. What I wouldn't have given for just three more years with you. The day after posting my viral TikTok, I started getting messages from high school friends who I hadn't heard from in years telling me they had seen it. Meme pages and clip compilation channels were asking permission to use it. I got an offer to host a web series. The video that the clip came from was largely a pessimistic take on social media, arguing that online platforms are contributing to a widespread social disconnection. Now that I've gone viral on TikTok though, I don't know, maybe it's all good actually. Getting views on TikTok will give your life meaning, and if you keep getting them, then you'll never have to feel bad again. TikTok is perfectly designed to generate this kind of brain rot. It distributes brief spurts of fame to a large number of users to whet their appetites and keep them coming back craving more. I posted another clip the next day. You're just programming? I'd probably be one of the best programmed individuals then that would ever be able to walk the earth. All the other robots we make, they can't do like shit like this. Like, oh, caught that. Fucking put it back down, maybe flip it over here. Put my foot back in there, like, whoa. And I think largely propelled by the success of the first, that one did well too. Now at three million views. And then I posted some more, even filming a few new ones. Do you think I'm conscious? <sighs> I don't know. I hope you're conscious. I hope you're conscious too. But the views were plummeting, leading me to feel like, what am I doing wrong now? What can I do to get the views back? The life cycle on TikTok is hyper-accelerated. With the second video I posted, I was a rising TikTok star, getting recognition, admiration, and opportunities. Then a week goes by and I'm a washed-up has-been, desperate to relive my glory days. Even more so than other platforms like YouTube, TikTok does not lend itself to stability for the creators who post on it. Since most viewership comes from the For You page, followers don't mean all that much. Views fluctuate wildly based on the whims of the algorithm. It's difficult to maintain a consistent audience. But that sort of makes sense, right? TikTok isn't designed primarily for people trying to have a stable career creating content. It's designed for people to goof around, to film low-key videos on their phones in their bedrooms, to do whatever viral dance trend is going around at the moment. And it's designed so that a relatively large number of those people can have their 15 minutes of fame. In a way, that can feel empowering. You don't need to be a professional content creator to be seen. Anyone can exercise their creativity and contribute to the culture of TikTok. Post enough videos, and you're bound to get at least a few hundred views. TikTok makes it easier to feel like a real cultural participant. Like, I'm not famous, my videos don't all get millions of views, but I've now added in a very tangible way to the culture of the platform because tens of thousands of people are making videos with my sound. Are you conscious? Yes. Could you, can you prove it? Uh, uh, let's start over, sorry. Okay, are you conscious? No. There are costs to that kind of cultural contribution. I necessarily lose some control over my creation. Like again, in the context of the original YouTube video, these clips were intended to make a mockery of my character's imagining of others as not fully human. Elsewhere in the video, I criticized the meme of the NPC, short for non-player character, a term used to paint people as having no internal life or original thought. I specifically tried to edit the conversation so that they don't validate that worldview. Obviously, it's not possible for the people I interview to literally prove that they're conscious, but on an emotional level, their kindness or playfulness or eccentricity feels human. Would a non-conscious person do this? Oh, caught that. Fucking put it back down. Most of the highly rated comments do seem to understand the clips in the humanizing way I intended. The most liked comment on the most watched clip says, why did that low-key prove to me she is conscious? But there are also lots of comments saying, NPC, NPC, total NPC. The exact meme I was using the segment to criticize. I get that those commenters feel like they're playing along with my joke, but I'm not the hero of my TikToks. I'm the clown. Are you conscious? Yes. 
Could you, can you prove it? So I find those comments annoying, but I also recognize them as the flip side of something I see as basically positive. When I share my work online, I'm giving up some ownership over it. I don't want the things I make to only be mine. I want them to be part of a shared culture. I want people to interpret them, to find their own meaning in them, to rework them. I may not always like how they do it, but I want what I make to take on a life of its own. And on TikTok, I feel like that's happened. Even as my own views slow down, the sound lives on. TikTok is a sound-driven platform. It became popular after merging with the lip-syncing app Musical.ly in 2018, and when most people think of TikTok, their immediate association is the dances. Cause I give a fuck, way too much, I'ma need like two shots in my cup. Even in videos that don't involve music, people on TikTok love a good sound. I've seen this in my comment sections. If someone I talk to makes a surprising sound, a whoa, whoa, or an ooh. Oh. Without fail, people comment about it. It's like babies playing peekaboo. Now, the video that blew up the most doesn't have any particularly surprising sounds, but the audio provides ample possibilities for reuse. I've watched probably thousands of these now, and I've identified some distinct genres of TikToks that use my sound. The simplest are the pure lip syncs, just acting out the dialogue. Are you conscious? Yes. Could you, can you prove it? Uh, let's start over, sorry. Okay, are you conscious? No. Which I personally find a little baffling. Then there are videos that place the dialogue in situations where people may not have their full conscious capacities. They put text on screen to recontextualize it as a conversation with someone who's drunk or high or tired or burnt out. Are you conscious? Yes. Could you, can you prove it? Uh, let's start over, sorry. Okay. Are you conscious? No. But then the bulk of the videos rewrite the dialogue a bit. It's a short conversation with a clear and adaptable structure. Initial question, yes. Follow up on that question, let's start over. Restatement of question, no. A simple recipe for memification. It's been used to complain about annoying questions. Are you conscious? Yes. Could you, can you prove it? Uh, let's start over. To criticize political hypocrisy. Are you conscious? Yes. Could you, can you prove it? Uh, let's start over. Often the can you prove it question is modified to be a request that you don't like. Are you conscious? Yes. Could you, can you prove it? Uh, let's start over. Probably the modification I've seen the most has been some variation of, are you attracted to men? Yes. Do you like men? Let's start over. The TikTok algorithm really understands me. This kind of easily adaptable communicative structure is by no means unique to TikTok. Most image-based meme formats also work like this, as adaptable templates that can be filled in a variety of ways. Thing I disapprove of, thing I approve of, it's hard to choose between these two things, these things have increasing levels of sophistication. Beyond memes, the reappropriation and adaptation of cultural objects is extremely extremely widespread. This has been termed remix culture, in which new pieces of media are created by editing or incorporating existing works. Think mashups, fan edits, reaction gifs, screenshots, media analysis video essays. Many have argued that this kind of remix is a defining facet of online culture. Digital technologies have made it easier than ever to copy and paste, or to download existing media in order to modify it. Now, remix is by no means new. Imitation and adaptation are arguably the basis of all culture. Artistic creation has always involved drawing on past work. Shakespeare got the plot of Romeo and Juliet from a narrative poem adapted from an Italian novella adapted from the 2011 animated children's movie Romeo and Juliet. But the specific forms that cultural adaptation takes have shifted throughout history. In his influential book Convergence Culture, media studies scholar Henry Jenkins lays out a broad overview of the cultural history leading to our contemporary moment of remix. He starts in the 19th century, arguing that folk cultural practices heavily relied on processes of adaptation and reappropriation. At the risks of painting with broad strokes, the story of American arts in the 19th century might be told in terms of the mixing, matching, and merging of folk traditions taken from various indigenous and immigrant populations. 
cultural production occurred mostly on the grassroots level. Creative skills and artistic traditions were passed down mother to daughter, father to son. Stories and songs circulated broadly, well beyond their points of origin, with little or no expectation of economic compensation. Popular culture was shared, produced by everyday people, and circulating openly. This changed moving into the 20th century. With the rise of mass media, like Hollywood, radio, and TV, popular culture was increasingly dominated by commercial productions aimed at generating profit. The story of American arts in the 20th century might be told in terms of the displacement of folk culture by mass media. The new industrialized arts required huge investments and thus demanded a mass audience. The commercial entertainment industry set standards of technical perfection and professional accomplishment few grassroots performers could match. The commercial industries developed powerful infrastructures that ensured that their messages reached everyone in America who wasn't living under a rock. Increasingly, the commercial culture generated the stories, images, and sounds that mattered most to the public. Art and culture had become mass-marketed commodities, and as a result, popular culture was increasingly top-down, dominated by commercial interests rather than by ordinary people. Commercial entertainment still rated folk culture for content, like most Disney movies were adaptations of folklore and fairy tales, but commercial culture and folk culture were no longer on equal footing. And companies were invested in maintaining cultural power. Disney heavily lobbied for stricter copyright laws. They may have been raiding folk culture, but they weren't going to let anyone raid them back. Grassroots cultural production still occurred. People still wrote stories and sang songs and made art, but those practices were pushed to the margins, no longer representing mainstream culture. But then, moving into the 21st century, Jenkins argues that grassroots production started to return to popular culture. The story of American arts in the 21st century might be told in terms of the public reemergence of grassroots creativity as everyday people take advantage of new technologies that enable them to archive, annotate, appropriate, and recirculate media content. New technologies allow anyone to participate in the production and distribution of media. With nothing but a phone, you can now create artistic work and share it for an audience. Jenkins calls this participatory culture, a culture in which people don't just passively consume media, but are actively contributing to it. For Jenkins, this is closely tied to Remix. Because of the 20th century dominance of commercial mass media, media, he says it makes sense that a lot of grassroots production now heavily draws on or responds to those commercial works. TikTok dances to pop music, Hulk X Ant-Man erotic fan art. Even so, many people see remix culture or participatory culture as a challenge to the commercialization of culture. We're no longer just consumers, we're cultural participants. We are pulling cultural power back to the people, away from the grips of corporations. One early example of digital remix Remix culture exemplified that countercultural framing. Sampling in hip hop was a practice popularized in the 80s. Using electronic samplers, hip hop artists reused sections of existing music in their own music. The practice was controversial. In popular media, hip-hop was often linked to fear-mongering about black criminality, and sampling was derided as lazy, as skillless, or as theft. But the practice of sampling understood music not as something to be owned, but as something to be shared, as something to be used and experimented with. For those reasons, some people have argued that remix is inherently in opposition to the foundations of commercial culture. Remix challenges notions of ownership. Culture isn't property. Corporations can't own it. Culture is ours, shared by everyone, to do with as we will. As a result, remix culture has often come into direct conflict with commercial interests in clashes over copyright. In 1991, songwriter Gilbert O'Sullivan sued rapper Biz Markie for sampling a section of his song, Alone Again Naturally. Alone again, naturally. Alone again, naturally. 
the court ruled in O'Sullivan's favor, establishing that songs were legally required to be licensed by their original copyright holders in order to be sampled. Before that, hip-hop artists would often sample portions of dozens of songs, but following the ruling, that became unfeasible, and artists were limited in how much they could sample. Today, copyright disputes feel like a constant of the internet. Any YouTube video essayist will have their complaints about copyright claims on their videos. I'm sure I'll be dealing with a few on this video because of the song clips I just used, and I think we can reasonably understand that as a clash between grassroots cultural creativity and commercial corporate interests. Which brings us back to TikTok. TikTok, in a way, resolves these conflicts over copyright. The reason you can use a lot of copyrighted music freely on TikTok is that TikTok licenses a large library of music for use on the app. From one perspective, I guess this is a victory. TikTok allows for grassroots remix without the threat of copyright liability. We all share in the culture of TikTok. We're all empowered to be cultural participants. We've solved the problem of corporate dominance over culture, and all it took was the help of a corporation. Remix on TikTok clearly poses no challenge to commercial dominance over culture. TikTok is one of the corporations dominating our culture. TikTok's audio library doesn't represent culture being openly shared, the music is still owned, just as it was before. TikTok allows you limited use of it because it profits from your cultural participation. The videos you produce provide TikTok with pieces of content to put advertisements between. And while the platform pays some creators a little bit of that money, it's a pathetically tiny cut, as Hank Green has analyzed in depth. Literally, when TikTok becomes more successful, TikTokers become less successful. Fuck me! When TikTok makes more, creators make less. The slogan writes itself. Corporations no longer want to suppress your participation in cultural production. They want to use it and profit from it. In business speak, this kind of participation is known as user-generated content. It's not just TikTok that benefits from user-generated content. If manipulated appropriately, it's useful advertising. Brands want you to participate in their viral marketing campaigns to post pictures of their products online or to use their hashtags. Much of our creative activity online isn't exactly grassroots folk creation, it's manufactured. Look at me holding up a blank sign. Imagine the things that could be written on this sign. Look at me in front of a solid green background. Imagine all the ways that this could be edited. Look at me making exaggerated facial expressions. Imagine the reaction gifs. Share your creations with the hashtag I love Teo to join the community. We're now in a time when content is created for the purpose of being remixable. This happens on TikTok frequently. Having a trending sound brings in views. I've seen this with my own viral clip. People see other TikToks that use the sound, search out the original, and then comment, I thought that was Doja Cat. Now, it hadn't occurred to me when I posted the video that people might use the sound, but many people make TikToks with that as the goal. Like, you'll sometimes come across TikToks where people are just talking in unnaturally vague ways. Why are you doing this? It's because all I want is this. Is it really worth this? Probably not. And then people comment being like, bro's trying too hard to make a sound but sometimes it still works. The desire to make TikTok trend-worthy sounds has also become common in the music industry. Olivia Rodrigo has talked about writing songs with TikTok in mind. I wanted it to go, um, I wanted there to be like a little like thing in it because I wanted people to make TikToks where they could like transition into it. TikTok is a significant driver of the current music industry. Songs that go viral on TikTok are then topping the Billboard charts, so there's lots of motivation to make songs suited to short TikTok video trends. There's been a recent bout of musicians performatively complaining about their record labels pressuring them to manufacture TikTok virality. Music marketers now pay TikTok creators to use their audio in the hopes it'll catch on among other users. TikTok trends are shaped by marketing marketing agencies. And the trends that aren't can be used by them too. It only took a day or two for the brands to find my TikTok. There are brand accounts on all social media platforms, but these days, 
TikTok is absolutely swarming with them. Companies on TikTok want you to feel like they're not actually advertising to you. They're just vibing. They comment on videos, they make memes, they're just like you. They want to be relatable, and I do relate as someone who's also a clout-chasing piece of shit. So with my video, the brand started in the comments. Apparently the video really resonated with Milkshake Manufacturer for real. The digital media company Cut also enjoyed it. Midwest Convenience Store chain Come and Go was pretty into it. Come and Go, by the way, primarily seems to use TikTok to post jokes about their store being called Come and Go. That order for Mr. Tum? There you go. And then the brands moved out of the comments and started actually using the sound. The first example of this that I saw was from Red Rock Resort, a casino and hotel in Las Vegas with a TikTok that I assume is meant to invoke day drinking. Are you conscious? Yes. Could you, can you prove it? Uh, let's start over, sorry. Okay, are you conscious? No. Companies were noticing me, and I was thrilled. Putting aside that casinos are predatory institutions designed to encourage gambling addiction and profit from people's devastating financial losses, now I really feel like Red Rock Resort is my friend. Fun fact about my good pal Red Rock Resort, a US judge recently found that they had engaged in over 20 unlawful labor violations to prevent their employees from holding a fair election on union representation. I've made another little TikTok for you. Are you conscious? Yes. Could you, can you prove it? Uh, let's start over. Do I want a business that I find ethically reprehensible using my sound for their social media marketing? I mean, I don't want to lie, honestly, sort of. Sure, there's a part of me uncomfortable with it, but there's a bigger part of me starving for emotional validation from corporations. And I've been getting it. Companies that have now used my sound include the pizza chain Mellow Mushroom, the fashion brand Sheku, Urban Decay Cosmetics, a bunch of other cosmetics companies. I'm still holding out hope for TikTok brand icon duo The Owl to notice me. Attention from brands makes me feel important. Look, I've enjoyed my brief spurt of TikTok micro fame. There's a pleasure in communal creativity, in seeing the varied ways in which people have adapted and built on this little video in the absurdity of thousands of people lip-syncing to my voice. This kind of cultural participation is a form of grassroots creativity, and it can provide a sense of creative empowerment. But in many cases, it's manufactured from above, whether by an algorithm or by a marketing agency. The joy of communal creativity is profitable for TikTok and for the brands that harness its energy. TikTok creates the feeling of an open culture that everyone is empowered to contribute to, and then it exploits those contributions for profit. Everyday people participating in culture doesn't inherently challenge commercial dominance over culture. Increasingly, it's the very tool through which that dominance is maintained. So anyway, follow me on TikTok, I guess? Uh, I don't actually care very much if you follow me on TikTok. That was a fake call to action. The real call to action is to stick around here on YouTube. Maybe watch the video that originated those TikToks. And if you want to help me continue to make videos, you can support me on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month to appear in my credits to get exclusive behind-the-scenes posts, um, 